It's great to see everybody. How are you doing, Nicole? I'm doing great. It's Friday, and uh, here we are with the Wazer, as I've seen him <laughs> called now. The Wazer. Oh, oh, only, only, only Paul and a, and a select few. Only Paul. <laughs> no, N Nicole, of course. You're, you're on that list. Of course. Too. Well, thank great. you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> like, I, you know what? I feel like I'm drowning a little bit in here do you? you know like I'm, you <laughs> like like i'm i'm drowning <laughs> someone totally. someone did say it looks like you had half a head so <laughs> it's true martha, uh, yeah martha colburn drowning and you know so martha's not the first person to say that <laughs> hi martha Ma she's many right. people have commented that i only have half a head so um, martha's awesome we love martha she's a brilliant filmmaker friend of mine i've known for years we I'm glad well, for it. Stephen, it, do you mind, like, to me, this is, like, such an interesting thing. You're just kind of, like, hitting right on that topic of, like, that balance between uh, Stephen is also an actor yeah, and has right. appeared in, in some of my, my favorite television programs, such as uh, the History Channel's depiction of Jesus. Stephen, that's right, uh, yeah. Stephen yeah, played yeah. Jesus. How does it, I mean, that's, how do you feel about, like, you know, how many people in history have played Jesus? You know, it's, in the a, really, it's a really small club. It really is. That's you right. Know, me, me and Willem Dafoe and uh, that's right. a couple of other people. Um, <laughs> right. I, I was also thinking of, like, how many Mickey Mouses there were. You know, Just and a small handful. Yeah. There, yeah. There are, like, three Mickey Mouses. I actually met the, the latest Mickey Mouse at a party. Did you really? And, yeah, uh, of course, he got very annoyed with me when I asked him if he could leave a message on my kid's phone. <laughs> <laughs> so he voices Mickey Mouse for the, um, the movies, for the Disney movies? Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah and, and I, I was so fascinated by it because, um, I mean, like, how, he said that there were only three Mickey Mouses in the history of Mickey Mouse, and the first that one was so Walt awesome. Disney. It does oh, wow. sound, yeah, it does sound difficult to yeah. believe, doesn't it? Yeah, he said the second one after Walt Disney was like the longest one. Ah, that's uh, why. Yeah, because the, right, he, the second one had the throne the longest. And then he, he told me about the process of becoming Mickey Mouse too, like, okay. which is like fascinating thing. Maybe, I, maybe different than the process of becoming Jesus? Yeah, no, Jesus, you just roll out of bed. You either just have it or you don't. No, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> that's, um, that's a long process too. It's like no, you know, it's that's a figure that you know is written in a storied, complex history that's mm -hmm. by many, many, many people interpreted many, many, many ways, and it's been um, you know looked at cinematically. It's been looked at in all these sort of fictionalized and religious forms. And for me to come along a handful of years ago when I did it and say, "Hey, this is my." my history channel version on, you know, you know, time machine beyond the Da Vinci code in relation to another right. fictionalized, you know, um, sort of mystery book that's also turned into a movie is a whole other, whole other deal. But um, I, you know, I read about sort of the Jesus street preachings and sort of what he did on a sort of day to day basis more than the more than the heroic stuff we know about um, from Bible passages. And I try to play it that way. So that was interesting. Fun. Well, the street, so the street did you, Jesus. <laughs> would have been great if you could have worn a do rag and glasses, you know, like kind of like the, the newer updated version of Jesus. The updated you know? version, yeah, with my iPod uh, earplugs. Something that we can all relate to now, exactly. you know, with the earpods and everything. <laughs> yeah, that, that would have been fun. But I, um, let's, like, I've got some questions about this, like, you know, and, and even the first time I met you, I, you know, like, you told me that you're an actor and everything, yeah. and, and, and also an artist. I, I thought, oh, wow, what, a, I mean, it's like, you're almost coming at from it from a different point of view, where there's a lot of actors that are, you know, have been acting and are maybe very well known. I'm, I'm also thinking of, like, Jim Carrey, you know, who, sure. like, paints on the side but you came from it from the other angle where like you you were trained as an artist and then right. you that's started right. acting that's right that's right well i mean i think I, i'm very lucky i went to a really good school uh the maryland institute college of art and um they have a pretty diverse 
art history and um, film history program. And I was an undergrad and learned a lot about uh, foreign films. And not knowing the language, I had to really focus on the formal aspects of filmmaking and what performers do to get their point across and to help deliver a story. And I just thought, wow, it's really interesting. You know, this is a part of my quest as a fine artist, a visual artist, and I don't find it that different. And I, yeah. um, but you know, there was a point where I wanted to collaborate with film crews and other creatives to sort of, to make that. Having put the onus on ourselves as visual artists where we make most of our own stuff, I just thought, you know, I, I want to do the same thing with my person, but I want someone else to set up the scenario and the storyline and all these things that I just have to respond to. I have to study it, but I have to respond to it in sort of real time, you know, piece by piece, scene by scene. I thought that was mm -hmm. so different than, um, you know, what we all do as fine artists. So I, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a sharp jump. It was something I needed to do at the time. So, um, well, l let me, you know, this kind of goes into, because in, in both cases, we're talking about a craft, right? The craft right. of acting or the craft of, of making artwork. And, right. um, you know, maybe, you know, could you, could you tell us a little bit about your, the process maybe? And, and is there a, a connection between your craft as an artist and maybe the way that you approach it? Is it similar to the same way that you go about making your, your artwork? And because the one thing I wanted to say about your artwork, too, is that, you know, it's uh, when I see your work, the first thing that comes to mind is I see that it's so much about surface, you know, about, about the various it's, it's very tactile. It's about the surface qualities, so much of it. And of course, the, the overall form, you know, right. in, in that sense, you kind of like take the, the minimal the minimalist approach. I'm taking <laughs> thinking of like David Smith, but you take it further because you're involving us like on a, on a tactile level, you know? Um, sure, sure. <laughs> so I, I kind of put out a lot there and, and maybe if you can you know, like, tell us a little bit more about that, Stephen, that'd be great. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, preparing my artwork, which is absolutely minimal in form and um, sort of does, does, you know, I think it does interact with audiences, it does sort of call them to look, look closer, touch, feel, you know, sort of, sort of engage in it in more than just, uh, oh, hey, that's a pretty object, which some people think is true about the works too. Um, most of my work are charged with ideas and themes and titles that allude to things that are important to me, but they don't always necessarily um, impact the viewer. They're not necessary for viewer engagement, I think. Um, but the fact that they are tactile, you know, some, some of them have handles, some, you know, sort of float off the wall, whatever the case, they, they enter into your space. Um, that, um, that is something that, um, you know, the themes that I just alluded to um, are asking you to. I mean, some of my pieces that don't look like they're political, they're pretty political, you know, and some are about personal space and what we do with objects and electronics and all of these things that, you know, face us here and now. Um, but to answer your question about preparing the pieces and creating them, you know, they're, they're ideas that come to me relatively, I say relatively quickly, but I think ideas sort of have a long haul in our personal lives and then they sort of come out formally and we take notes and say, hey, I want to turn this into a piece of fine art. Um, and then the actual making of it is, um, it's not tedium for me. I think for some mm -hmm. people, they would think that it is, it's actually kind of sure. a, a calming, meditative zen, meditative mm -hmm. yeah. series of moments that I like. Are there some parts of that that I would like to move ahead faster than others? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would I like to get to the end piece and say, hey, this is fantastic, now I get to show people, of course. But um, yeah, and it, to com contrast that with preparing for a role in motion pictures or, or television, um, you know, you, I study somebody else's work over and over again, a script. And then at some point I say to myself, okay, I want to contribute X, Y, and Z to it. And I hold on to some of those ideas. And then when you get on set, you've got to release many of those ideas mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of a location you're on, because of another actor you're working right. with. And, um, and sometimes just because the director comes up with a brand new idea. Um, 
There sure. was a television show I did a while ago called NCIS Los Angeles, and I played a pretty hardened criminal on that show. And the executive producer really liked the work that we did and the audition and um, the, um, the table reading and all that, and, and, and ultimately liked the show. But I remember he approached the director who said, hey, wouldn't it be great if he had done X, Y, and Z? And so that director stuck to um, some things she knew that she had to cover that you have to hand in to an editor to make this thing work. So I guess my point is about all of that is you can only do so much and then you have sure. to hand it over. And even the people who manage that and make those decisions like directors, even they have to sort of hand it over to some of the protocols. Um, so there, there, yeah, there are some differences there. I mean, I, yeah. there, the funny thing is, is that I think my work is about in a certain way is about character and class and about um, sort of what we do and how we live in our interior lives and the things that populate our suburban homes or urban homes or whatever the case may be. Um, but they're done in such a formal way, you know, I can see why some viewers may think it really is just about um, the surface, but I do think the surface is a way inside. So I think, yeah. I think, you, I think what you're saying is right. Yeah. I think it's a way to sort of get you like, oh, isn't that interesting? Hey. Right. And All right. you're, um, there's, um, uh, as, a, as an actor too, you're almost more like a tool. And a, a tool is, is, is um, yeah, a, a tool. really sure. rude way of putting it. So I, but, but, but you are being directed. <laughs> yeah, you are being, you're, you know, you're like the skill saw of a director and a producer, <laughs> you know, how's that? Yes, that's true. You're, you're much more like a skill saw. And in, in your case, you're like a, a very high grade sandpaper. Right, you, right. 600, <laughs> 1200. You're exactly like wet, wet sandpaper. Wet sandpaper, uh, 2000. You're, you're like that, you're like the tool of them. And um, have you ever considered maybe being a director or directing um, or maybe, or, or even writing, you know, I mean, the, the process of, of uh, film and television is so different in some ways than, than what we do as visual artists, because, yeah. you know, as, as visual artists, we're kind of like doing the whole thing by ourselves. We conceive of, of the, the piece, we, we make the piece, you know, we present it, we're like at every stage, and um, right, right. it's like working on film and television, I can only imagine would be that much more elaborate. Right. In that sense. That and it is, and I've had the good luck of um, directing a handful of music videos that have aired on MTV or other places like that and a couple of commercials and short bits. And, um, and it really is, you know, there's a director I worked with years ago, a guy named David Fincher. And he said that, you know, directing a film, and I think this is true even on the small scale that I can have done it, is like painting with just a handful of colors with a brush that's like three miles long. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. that you hope you can see what's way at the other end of it. And you've got all these people to help manage to make sure that it sort of lands in the right place and that you sort of get what you need at the end of the day. And, and yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a little obviously more control than my work as an actor. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty fastidious as a director too. I plan a lot. I, I, I put together a lot of storyboards. I try to hire the best people so that I don't have to manage their job on the day. I can just manage the stuff I need to, which is whatever's captured in front of the camera um, yeah. and hopefully, hopefully get the best thing. But uh, yeah, I would love um, to do it though on a bigger scale. Yeah. Well, you're, it, it, and again, let's get back to, you know, your, your artwork. Um, sure. And again, I, I don't, I, the reason, you know, I, I'm bringing up the, the, the work that you've done as an actor too is because I'm thinking of it like more, you as more of a, of a creative person, you know, sure. and, yeah. and the various roles. And I think it's kind of a fascinating, for me, it's, it's fascinating to hear that because in one sense, you're working within a team, you know, on a, you know, as a team member, and now you're working in isolation. Uh -oh. oh, there he is. <laughs> we, there he is. We lost you for a minute, Paul. Can, I, I, yeah, somebody called me. Uh, so, of course, so, they always do. So much for Instagram Live, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Instagram so, delayed. Yeah, exactly. But um, 
anyway, but in, in this sense, you're working, you're working in isolation and by yourself. And, um, yeah. and a lot of, I, I mean, the materials that you're using are super important, right? I mean, because yeah. we're, we're looking at these and thinking of like the juxtaposition of this material and this one and what happens when mm -hmm. you put them together, you know, almost like, um, you know, I, I think of them um, in, in terms of shape, form, and texture, or, or like the, the, the things that are super important, and you're talking about the, the process of putting this together and, and refining. I mean, your, your pieces are like highly refined, right? Yes, I mean, they like, take a lot of, yeah, super duper incredible refinement, and they have to be really well protected. I mean, after I make them, I put them in. <laughs> I maybe have shown you images of this, but I've put some of them in. Um, I buy these sort of high price Pelican um, protective cases, the kind that they use for like, um, you know, expensive camera equipment or, you know, rifles, <laughs> firearms, right. except mine are loaded with art. <laughs> yeah. I'm really, I'm really about peace and love. And, and then after that, I package them and create them and do all the other things when they go off to shows and with elaborate instructions, you have to do this first so they don't get chipped or banged or, yeah, it's, right. it's a little bit too, it's too much even for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, there, there yeah. is. Um, with oh, oftentimes with work like that, it, it does. It takes heavy protection. Um, I mm -hmm. I yeah. have a uh, a friend who actually, and he's been he was in the show in the at um, in the LA Story Show. His name yeah yeah um, Ernest Velarde, uh, sure. who passed away. Um, uh, I think maybe two years ago. Or was it last year? It was fairly recently. But mm -hmm. his work was um, it was egg tempera on mm -hmm. illustration board. And oh boy. he was very insistent on how it was all protected, that it had to be protected behind a certain type of glass, you know, wow. because of the vulnerability of it. And, and I think of yours as, as a bit like that, too, that it's, it's just such a highly refined surface that it also has to be protected as well, you know. Which is funny, because if you look, if you sort of think about the elements that are in a number of my pieces, you know, they include... Corian, which is a countertop that you know oh, yeah. you can that you know that's really super tough. And if you look at cabinetry, you know people really wildly abuse cabinetry all the time in their kitchens at home. And but when you put them all together and call it fine artwork and center it on a wall, it's a, it's a different story. It's it's not forgotten, and it certainly is more exposed. I guess it's a lot more vulnerable yeah. in some ways. You know, so yeah. it's like any creative act, I guess. Absolutely. So um, tell us a little bit about your process then. Or do you start off with sketches? Do you start off with thinking about the materials you're going to use and how they're going to work together or like, you know? Yeah, that's a good question. Absolutely. Um, usually the ideas to me come uh, pretty quickly. I, I, I sometimes will wake up in that funny waking state before we enter the conscious world and we write down our to-do lists to get stuff done, um, I often will c come up with ideas. I'll write them down just as text on a sheet of paper. And if there's a formal way I can express that, I'll quickly jot it out as a sketch, um, just so I can have it close by with a lot of other sketches. It's important for me to look at a lot of different sketches of the work so I can figure out A, which I can do sort of in, in what order, which are more practical, somewhat easier to do, even though they're all really difficult to do. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, if I can sort of um, maximize my, my time when cutting them and sometimes can do them together, whether they're paired thematically or they could be exhibited thematically or not, may or may not affect it. And then I go ahead and I um, will often draw them in Photoshop. Uh -huh. So I can get, I get a more precise idea of sort of what they look like, what, cast shadow will look like on them. I sometimes do 3D renderings in um, SketchUp. Most of the time it's just simple 2D renderings with a little shadow here and there, just so I can get an idea about proportions and placement and things. I don't sure. need them to be, I don't need them to be like, you know, like, you know, major motion picture, you know, 3D, you know, motion graphics kind of stuff. Right. I just need it. They're really a guidebook for me. Um, sure. So that when I go ahead and, and trim them up and cut them and make them. I'm, I have something that's pretty precise and I have, it, I have them ready to go. So at that point, um, I'll collect materials. A lot of my work is made out of simple things like MDF, um, which is just a medium density fiber board um, and, or like I said, Corian or something else. And 
I'll collect all these things, measure them out, cut them, um, get them trimmed up sand, sand it, and then the tedious part of sealing the edges, smoothing them out, in some cases adding veneer, like the piece that's at Bernau, um, staining it, sanding it again, um, really tons and tons and tons of, you're joking about sanding earlier. <laughs> but a huge joking. part of my work is like filling, sanding, filling, sanding, filling, sanding, yeah. sanding, 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 and more sanding. And I sort of put these jokey um, posts of me sanding stuff on Instagram once in a while, because I think it's yeah. funny. It might be boring to some people, but it's just sort of like, this is, this is what I do. And then the last few steps, the pretty steps that people like, are me putting on prime coats, um, sometimes finished coats. Sometimes I'll hand off top coats to um, cabinet finishers or I'll rent their paint booth and I'll do it just depending on what's available and timing. It depends on where I am. I mean, right now I'm in, I'm based in California, but right now I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina, and there are a couple of paint shops and some are cool and they'll let me go ahead and do it. And sometimes they have to do it. So it just yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Interesting. Yeah. Um, do you use um, uh, CNC machines? So uh, for those of you who don't know, CNC machines are compute, uh, what does CNC stand for? Computer navigated something. But basically you're, you're drawing things like an Illustrator or maybe a CAD program, and then they're right. being cut out by, uh, by a laser that's being guided by your drawing. By a router, that's right. Yeah. That's so this, yes. Like, um, for me, this piece right here, yeah. this is one that I drew in um, an Illustrator and then right. I had it cut out in plexiglass and then airbrushed. So I was wondering, yeah. you, you have very precise forms in yes. your work too. Um, is that something that you also use? It is something I also use. Um, I hand cut a number of pieces and I have um, radius round corner templates that I use with a, with a router by hand, but some of the more elaborate ones I will design in Photoshop or Illustrator, just like you. Mm -hmm. And I'll hand it off to a company that has this giant flatbed CNC machine with a router on it and makes some yeah. pretty precise cuts. Mm -hmm. But the material I use, um, I have to go back in by hand and sand and reroute and trim route and do all this other stuff to it after they make the basic cut. But the great thing about that is that it really helps um, when you hand it off to a company that does that is that when you, if you have a series of pieces that stack and because my pieces are floating, um, it really helps to line those pieces up. Mm -hmm. There are two new pieces that I did that re absolutely required the CNC. The piece I did that's at Brunel, um, I lined up by eyeball and hand and pencil, and it took forever. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I said, I, the best. what's that? Sometimes that way, like the traditional way, you know, the analog way of doing it, it works better in some cases, you know? It does. It absolutely does. I relied on... Um, the CNC method that helped me line up a couple of pieces with pegs that I have up in my, um, my frog room. For those who aren't familiar, frog rooms in the Southeast are finished rooms over garages. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm, I'm currently using that as one of my studios and part of a garage while I'm here in the North Carolina area. Mm -hmm. And there's a piece that I'm working on um, right now that, um, that I brought to be CNC'd and because the pegs are so wide, they're these fluted pegs, you really have to jam them down to get them in there. Well, they've just been beautifully finished, so there's no jamming. <laughs> there's no jamming in and around beautifully finished work, so I have to trim all the pegs down and do stuff to it. And at the end of the day, it's like back to being by hand, you know? It's, <laughs> yeah. It's pretty funny. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of your work, too, the majority of the it's very wide pieces. Um, and I'm wondering, have you, uh, have you also done sculpture? Because, I mean, they, they are so much three-dimensional. They're about shape. They're about form. They're about the tactility of them. You know, have you also done sculpture as well? Well, I mean, I consider the wall work sculpture. They're kind of relief sculpture. Um, I've done a, a few 3D pieces sort of in the early part of my career, in the back in the 90s. Um, <laughs> I did some little small 3D pieces um, that were based on some of my interests in work related to environmentalism and to um, animal rights and other things like that. And, um, um, but they were so small. They were these sort of like miniatures. And they, I, 
you know, I sort of became fascinated with the observation of a whole small world in its entirety, you know, because I think that's, it's almost an impossible thing to see in this world. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's, but to see it is, gives you the idea that it is possible to at least review some important things. Not that that exists in real life because mm -hmm. art isn't, isn't necessarily life as we know. So yeah. I have done a few. It's I a representation one, of life. You know, it is, it sounds so simple it and is. it's often said, but it really is at the end of the day, it, it really is. Um, I did a 3d piece a couple of years ago that showed at the, um, um, here in Wilmington at the Cameron art museum that was just a series of four by fours, which was just, <laughs> it sounds simple, but they were made into this sort of four shaped square. And there's another one in a sort of this four unit shaped square that are just put together with lag bolts, except it's missing one piece. There's this lucite glass light hanging above it, almost like it's being dropped by a crane and a giant, you know, a, a giant sort of braided cable into place like a building piece. And that was sort of about, um, you know, it was sort of about sort of the idea versus the actual, you know, a lot of my pieces mm -hmm. are about, th are about that, you know, and the actual is still a perception, you know, <laughs> at the mm -hmm. end of the day, something I call actual still might not be to somebody else. And so, you know, I always thought that that piece was about, um, at the, and the name of it was like uh, one to 1.1. 1 .1. It was sort of like the idea of like the better self. You know, mm -hmm. instead of one to one, instead of a direct correspondence, it's the, hey, if I just do this, if I just upgrade me this way, I'll be better, which is such mm -hmm. a funny notion that we all have. And that we, by the time we get there, we're almost, I don't want to say bored with it, but we realize that, you know, the compendium of stuff that adds up to us is so much more than that one thing. Mm -hmm. And it becomes this sort of, impo it's, it becomes this thing that's almost out of reach and very different and very I don't know. In that case, it was a, a glowing lucite box. It was like this perfect box above hunks of four by four. <laughs> yeah. Posts, you know, anyways. So yes, well, I've done a few. I've done a few. Yeah. I, I mean, I, cause I, I could see that being um, a, a really interesting direction, you know, uh, in, instead of, uh, again, instead of being something that is on the wall, you know, I mean, because we, we approach something on the wall differently than we do on the floor. That's right. right. I mean, we tend to have more reverence for things that are on the wall than things that are on the floor, you know, because our dog sits on the floor. Our, right. um, you know, the dog's food sits on the floor. That's right. You know, That's right. all kinds of things. So we, we have a different, uh, a, a diff we approach them in different ways. And right. like you were saying, there's something different um, about things that are on the floor. They're actual pieces, you know, rather than right. things on the wall, which are reproductions, generally speaking. Right. Um, or, you know, right. It, I, and, I, I, absolutely, yeah. So That's we right. approach them differently, and um, I, I could easily see, like, a, a lot of your work in that, presented in that way, you know, as, as three-dimensional pieces yes. rather than two-dimensional ones. I, mm -hmm. It's funny you mention that, because when I assembled a couple of my circular pieces, like, similar to the one that Bernal has, I, I made some here in North Carolina that were just made of Corian and... Um, finished lacquer paint before I set up a space to shoot them on. I have a big white wall now that I've set up in the, in my frog room so that I, and I have a sort of, you know, pro photo set up so I can shoot works. I started to shoot them on the ground because I figured if I light them from the side and there's a big sheet of something mm. blank below it, who's going to know the difference, right? <laughs> but they're on the ground facing <laughs> up. And I just thought, this is great. It's like they're growing out of the ground, these things. And, um, and I have set aside with my long series of notes I alluded to earlier, um, some drawings of those similar works that are sort of growing out of the ground. Yeah. That, w you know, will be different, you know, that will be approached differently, that will be not protected differently, that will be looked at differently and, you know, sort of lit and interacted with. So um, you're onto something, Paul. <laughs> yeah. I, um, there's, there's something about your work too that is, um, you know, I mean, and I think it's the domestic part of it that you've talked about, too, is that they yeah. are, um, there's something unassuming about it, you know, sure. like, oh, well, what, you know, like, what is this thing? It, it looks like it's supposed to be functional, but right. it doesn't look like it functions in any way, you know? Right, um, right. And, and there's kind of a fascination and kind of like almost satirical aspect to them. Um, 
There is a little bit, for sure. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, there, there, it's all kind of like suggesting something, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of suggestion in, in the work, and uh, I, yeah. but that's that's what creates the intrigue. That's the fascination about it. You know, it's like, wow. I hope this, so. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, is uh, it, is this you know what I think it is, or is it not? You know, and again, um, it, it's a little unassuming in that way. But you also spend a lot of time, I um, in the process of making them, a, you know, to have. I, I mean, they're incredibly deliberate work. Sure. You know, there, there's not, there, there's not like a, a, a lot of chance involved in it in, in that sense. Right. Um, you know, they're very well thought out, very composed, um, you know, o almost like, um, you know, like a, a piece of music by like Brian Eno. Sure. You know, or Philip sense. Glass or somebody like that. I, I yeah, just, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say Philip Glass. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Which is funny the because the, the roles I play on TV and in film are wildly erratic characters. <laughs> you played David Bowie. I played <laughs> Bowie. Many, many years ago, I played Bowie on stage. I put together yeah. um, a great tribute act that included Mike Bassich, who was the keyboardist from Oingo Boingo. No joke. Oh, yeah. um, my friend Mitchell Sigmund, who played keyboards um, synth for um, Berlin um, in, the latter, in the sort of latter years of Berlin. And my friend Beth and Bernie, all these great musicians, and I just thought, what are they doing in my Bowie tribute act? And it was, it was, it was a, it was a tribute to his great work. And I just thought, I've got them behind me. I'm just going to let loose. So yes, I played uh -huh. Bowie on stage. It was a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Pretty fun. Excellent. Yeah. Man. So. Um... <laughs> I'm learning so much about Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Drug dealers, sycophant psychos, fringe dwellers, savior figures. <laughs> Yeah, yep, that's my that's my lot in life. Runs no the gamut, yeah. I haven't played any lawyers and dads yet, so I think, I think that, that's my pattern. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I think it's, everything that we do is so about our it's about our experience and be able to open up your experience and and have an open mind to all these different possibilities. That's where the excitement yep. lies. For me, there's it nothing is. more exciting than potential. It so, is. Wow, it's the, what the, can we do? Right. I mean, every time I do work, and I'm sure, Paul, you agree with this, and I'm sure, Nicole, you've spoken with numerous artists about this. Every time we finish a work, we get done with it, and we go, great, that's kind of what I imagine. And then you're almost immediately on to the next three pieces mm -hmm. yeah. because of the possibility, because of the unknown, because mm -hmm. of the um, what lurks around the corner. Who will I be while I'm making this in a week, in two weeks, in three weeks? How will that affect the work? Obviously, that's in some ways more exciting. Yeah, you know, we do have we do have moments of repose and reflection when we are lucky enough to see a few of our works on a wall, or or you know, get together with great people like you both and talk about them. Um, and that's great. I yeah. I, I I love that. But uh, yeah, the unknown is really mm -hmm. quite a it's quite a wonderful that's the best place place to be. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it is. Um, like I I want to wake up every day and be a beginner. I'm starting from scratch here, you know? Well, I, I always find that my best days, um, and I'm, and Paul knows me, I'm a really, I'm a, I'm a health nerdy, like, you know, I pay attention to what I eat and I exercise every day and I'm kind of a nerd that way. I don't, I don't drink alcohol. I haven't in years. And, but he um, takes Geritol. But I take, <laughs> <laughs> soon enough, man, don't tell yeah. people. Uh -huh. <laughs> but sometimes I wake up and I go, you know, who am I? I, I preface mm -hmm. all that with I'm a healthy guy because it wasn't from like, you know, a raucous night out the night before. And I occasionally wake up with who am I? And it's the best feeling in the world. It's the feeling mm -hmm. of there is a blank slate ahead of me. Yeah. There is a glass half full. There are some things I can, can contribute my life with without the bearing of my wrenched in, ripped in, burned in di identity or yeah. one that I've perceived or that I think other people have perceived and I think those are some of my best days. You yeah. Know, I don't, you know, what, isn't there a David Crosby album? Like, you know, I can't remember like a million years ago that came out. That's like, I don't, I don't know my name or I don't remember my name or I forget what it is. Now his was probably from a drug haze. I'm telling you, mine's not. Um, <laughs> so. It's really not. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. Um, it's, it's my all time favorite movie. It's called Dead Man. 
Um, it's a Jim Jarmusch. Oh, yeah, sure. I've seen it. Jim Jarmusch. Hey, we yeah. have the same birthday, Jim Jarmusch and I. Different years, oh, same day. Good, same good, yeah. good guy. I, I'm a huge Jim Jarmusch fan. And, yeah, I love uh, him. Yeah, he's great. Well, that was the one with Johnny Depp. And remember yes, his yeah. name, Johnny Depp's name in the film is William Blake. And he <sighs> of meets, course, the writer. Yeah. Right, William Blake, the writer. And yeah. so it just happens to be a coincidence, but his, um, his guide at the end of his life is somebody named Nobody, who's uh, a Native American. And, uh. and he comes to him and he says, uh, he asks him his name and he says, what, what's your name? And he says, I, I'm William Blake. And he goes, you're a poet. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm not a poet. I, I don't even know what you're talking about. And they start going in. So for the I forgot about movie, that. <laughs> the rest of the movie, he talks about him as a poet, as, as if he were way of life. <laughs> and so whenever I approach Stephen, I always think that I'm speaking to Apple, Apple, um, <laughs> the Apple founder of Apple Computers. The founder of Apple Computers, Stephen Wozniak. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I That's always, pretty funny. I love yeah, it. I, I always want to do that, but I don't want to insult you at the same time by doing that all the time because it could get really annoying. But, no, you know, it's funny though, but it's like, I, I like that you bring that up because there's a, that guy, ha, that character has a built in idea of who this person is based on his name. Yeah. And, and he continues to address him based on his understanding and reverence for a poet and not the guy who's in front of him. <laughs> but he, but yeah. he learns about that guy too. And, yeah. You know what? I think that's fine. I do get approached sometimes. Um, I used to have a, uh, a media production company and I get approached, hey, you're Steve Wozniak. Come speak at our university about, <laughs> you know, computer chips and the early days of Apple computers. I go, no, I'm, I'm an actor and an artist. And <laughs> it's all a big laugh. Um, I, I, one one, of, one, my, yeah, one yeah. of my favorite lines is um, when nobody says, um, um, Johnny Tepp's character shoots somebody um, with a gun, and he goes, you are now writing your poetry with blood. <laughs> <laughs> That's so Jarmusch. What in the yeah. corner? <laughs> you, um, I've, I've watched the movie at least 30 to 40 times. I'm wow. completely obsessed with it. Um, and the soundtrack is by Neil Young. Oh, and, who's br I love Neil Young. He's, he's and, a genius. I mean, he's brilliant, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, so if you haven't seen the movie, you have to see that. Those... That's I, one of my I have two to, and you, you, you need to go see the movie My Name is Nobody, which the is movie? a famous a famous western from the late sixties with um oh my god, are we getting into are we digressing into movie trivia fun here on this oh, art really? <laughs> That's so that's really interesting. I, it's a great movie. You gotta check it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Henry Fonda's it. in it and uh the guy who was into those Italian spaghetti westerns, um Quentin Tarantino. Okay. No, no, this is long before. This is 1968. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I have some uh, movies I, to add to my to watch Hill's list that, now. Yeah. yeah. Terrence Hill's great, yeah. Those are, those are such great films. I absolutely, I absolutely mm -hmm. love them. And as a kid, that, I was like an absolute film buff. I was like, from the totally. age of like 4 to 20, or 4 to 30, I was in movie theaters like nonstop. I was completely oh, yeah. obsessed with movies. And oh, totally. I, I had a, um, uh, a, um, an, uh, somebody that I was with at the time who got really annoyed at me, with me <laughs> for that reason. They were so annoyed. And they finally said, well, I'm not going to go to movies with you anymore. I'm not going to go to anything <laughs> with you anymore. And, did, you, and it, did you talk back at the screen, Paul? <laughs> Is that why? Yeah, I actually pulled a gun out of the screen one time. <laughs> Screw you! It was out of protection, though. Like, I, it was, it was, they pulled those out on me first, so. I know, you're just protecting yourself. I'm just protecting myself. Honest defense move, Paul. Exactly. I would hold up in court. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys, thank you so much. Stephen, it's been an honor and a pleasure to include Me you. Me too. Show. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's been great. This, you know, we, we were actually planning on this being the last one, but I think yeah. that we have to go into overtime. Okay. So Nic Nicole and I will go into a strategy about that. We're, uh, we're doing some, uh, some encore performances because right. people have just loved these so much and we've loved doing them so much. So yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we might tack a few in. I want to make sure I give a shout out to Robert Ryan Ireland left a comment and said the connection with conceptual music like Brian Eno gives me a greater appreciation for Stephen's work. Oh, um, cool. So I cool. so love that. 
uh, John Marcella Grant, very interesting. So I feel like we've gotten such great interaction from people yeah. who have been watching these. And um, I feel totally. really lucky to have learned so much you know, new information about these artists yeah. that I've, I've, <laughs> I've been living with your work for, you know, a year a now. A year, yeah. Um, exactly. and, and thankfully for, for those of you um, who haven't seen our recent Instagram post, Stephen's work we yeah. will get to live with forever because it's, it's permanent. Part, yeah. It's part of the Brunel University Permanent Art Collection. So yes. that will be installed on campus and along with Very a few cool. other pieces from the show. So we're really excited about that. I'm excited too. One yeah. of the in the other things that's really cool about Instagram Live is that you can actually watch these on YouTube as well. So, yes. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. So yes. I mean, they are they're recorded and they're on my Instagram page, mm -hmm. but you can all Nicole's also posting them to um, her YouTube Bra page. Mm -hmm. YouTube oh, excellent! Is it to the Brunel yes. Gallery's YouTube page or? So I um, we have basically it's under my name. Okay. But I will, I can send you a link and I'll make sure that now that they're all recorded, I'm catching up on a couple, but I will make sure that's on Instagram yeah. too. I'll post um, those, so yeah. I'm, I'm basically just kind of taking what the raw material off Paul's Instagram page and then just doing a, a few quick edits, um, you know, right. adding some title information, but yeah, then those are all available to watch on YouTube on repeat as well. Yeah. Super yeah. cool. I dig Excellent. it. Yeah, so well, um, I, I guess um, we'll be back. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, keep, an, we'll, keep an eye out. I, I want to join the all-star yeah. team for the encore performance. Can I, can I, can I fly? Absolutely. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a, a round table on the screen. Like, yeah. okay. I guess it'll be more like a Zoom. A square of, table. A, a, yeah. I love it. A square, a square <laughs> table, exactly. <laughs> A 16 by 9 table, uh, right? the size of a phone table. <laughs> it, will, it will be fun. And of course, Stephen, you'll be uh, invited back for that. So I'd love um, it. I'd love it. I you know what? You know, I've, got, I've got a great role for you to play. You could play What's Stephen a... Wozniak from Apple Computers. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? I auditioned for an Apple commercial as him, and I showed up, and they're like, Steve Wozniak? What? But I'm... I, if if you know me, I'm a pretty lean guy. And Steve I was just going to say that he's a yeah. very heavy dude. And so it, this was about ten years ago. And I um and I show up and I did my best to wear stuffed clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and needless to say, I didn't get the role, but I did star in another Apple commercial, totally independently of that, as a rock oh, cool. star a few years later. So. <gasps> oh, excellent! Wow. Tables turned, right? Tables <laughs> turned. <laughs> another another movie I really love. I love the um the Steve Jobs movies, mm. like the, every yeah, one that I've seen, good. I really love them. The one, um, the one with Aston Kutcher was really good, yep. actually. Mm -hmm. I, I was surprised yep. by how good it was, you know. Um, well, and, and I will say this. I, I did connect with Steve Wozniak. Um, he was going to be in town in L.A. To, be, um, to do Dancing with the Stars, and we were going to have lunch. And I read his book, and Steve Jobs had not passed. So I, I asked him, I said, hey, Steve Wozniak, um, does anybody own the rights to your life story? Because I just read his book. And he said, no, nothing like that. And I wrote up a treatment, and I sent it to him, and he liked it. But he didn't like the part where he lost two years of his memory because he had an, a plane accident. And then he swiftly sort of said, well, I've got some other friends in the business <laughs> who can develop this. And then... Of course, after the Steve Jobs movie got made, I didn't hear anything about it because, you know, he's an important guy with yeah. big people behind making big motion mm -hmm. pictures about computer moguls and developers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, did, we, we stayed in touch otherwise. Yeah. That's exciting. I, I have an amazing yeah. idea, Stephen. It would be so cool to be able to interview you and Stephen Wozniak. It would be. We're very different characters. <laughs> that would be, like, mind-blowing. <laughs> <laughs> so, Inception. Nicole and I, Nicole and I are here with Stephen Wozniak and Stephen Wozniak. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's make it happen. Let's manifest this. Let's do it. Come on, we'll make it happen. It's Absolutely. on the vision board. It's, all, it's, it's on the vision board. board. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're looking forward to seeing everybody again. S Stephen, thank you so much. It's been a blast. And um, of yep. course, Nicole, I'm looking forward to seeing you again sometime soon. 
You too. And thank yeah. you, Paul, for taking us through Absolutely. all of these fun adventures with our artists. Absolutely. Yeah, we're having a great Bye, time. Paul. Bye, Nicole. Why stop the fun? Why okay. stop the fun? I don't, I don't want it to end. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.